Lindsay and Patsy Worlidge weren't in a good place. The couple, who had been married for 10 years, had three children, all two years apart. Eight-year-old Eloise, six-year-old Anna, and four-year-old Blake. They lived in a nice house near the sea in Victoria, Australia. But there was trouble in paradise. The couple had been going through marital difficulties for quite a while, and in January of 1976, they were preparing to separate. The couple probably thought that the dissolution of their marriage is going to be the worst thing that would happen to their family. But on the morning of January 13th, 1976, their youngest child, Blake, came into the bedroom to tell them something that would change their lives forever. Eloise was missing. The girl had been safely tucked in her bed the night before, but on this morning, her bed was empty and the window was open. A search for their daughter was immediately launched, and this would become one of Australia's most enduring mysteries. When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell you the stories of those who never came home. I want to tell you the story of Eloise Worlidge. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Floyd. And this is, and then they were gone. everyone. So we have a special case for you this week. It is our first international story. Yeah. uh, So right away, I'm thinking of uh, the the case that happened in Portugal. Um, Oh, Maddie McCann? Yeah. 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 I I mean, so yeah, you're right. This is our first international case. And and just from the brief synopsis you just said, Mm -hmm. like I'm immediately thinking of Portugal and Madeline McCann. Madeline McCann. Yeah. Okay. I well. Yeah. You said Maddie McCann. Yeah. I guess that's the same. But you know that that's immediately where my thought process goes to. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, uh, I'm not right, and it's not. This is not going to be a story about how the uh, Australian PD or whatever locality in Australia blundered the case. No, actually. Oh, good. It's not. And and that is interesting because, um, you know, my sister who listens to this says that I'm very hard on police, <laughs> but they deserve it. I have no regrets. Um, but when they do a good job, I think I, I also make a point in saying that they do a good job. So the Morgan Nick case is one that stands out to me of, I have like no complaints with how the police handled that. Yeah. And this is another one where, again, it's so hard because this is 1976. I'm reading articles. And yeah. So I'm not inside of the investigation. I can't really say for sure that they did everything they could do. But from the articles that I read, many of which I was able to find contemporaneous articles, um, it really does seem like they just went for it and they did everything they could possibly do kind of like to briefly briefly touch on policing and and missing persons cases Mm -hmm. now again i have i have no training uh in missing persons cases because that is not anywhere near my purview in law enforcement Mm -hmm. but um i will say in general uh, i have been to a police academy uh, and the investigative portion of the police academy. And was it police academy four? Stop or Because that was the best one. Was that citizens on patrol? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> We're so old. <laughs> yeah. Most of our viewers are like, what is <laughs> viewers? Also, they're not viewers. Yep. Nope. <laughs> it's a podcast. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> most of our listeners <laughs> are probably like what is police academy mm-hmm. um anyway at no point during that portion of police training did they ever cover investigations on missing persons 
Now, I understand that that most missing persons cases would not be referred to a, a, a basic uniformed police officer. Right. But that's who answers the calls. Right. Before it makes it to a d- detective. Right. So, and we did kind of talk on that with the Ralph G. Marie case, yes. right? When we talked about canvassing the neighbors. Right. Because that job at least initially, typically does fall on the uniform guys. It falls to the first person that answers the call. Right. Now, I don't think there's a whole lot of training that and that goes into specifically missing persons. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that where the gap is in, uh, I know you generally disliking police. <laughs> Uh, versus what's what's happening in these cases is that I, I think there's a, a real lack of training as far as investigations into missing persons. Because a lot of times they will get turned over, even post-uniform guys, mm-hmm. they get turned over to a general investigator or, or detective or whatever who also does not have training in missing persons cases. Right. They're, they're Typically they're homicide detectives and they're looking for a body right away. Which, that's one area to cover, yes. For but sure. there, there's a huge gap where you need to cover connections to the family. And I know that those detectives kind of overlap in that area as well, but it's getting the timeline down about exactly where the person was and what they were doing right before, who had immediate connections, mm-hmm. uh, staying in close contact with the family because, yeah, they may end up being the suspects, but if they're not, you, like, you need their support in the investigation. You know, there's, there's a whole lot that goes into a missing persons investigation that, that I just don't think is covered in general police training. Well, and I think it's also important to note that the stories that we cover on this podcast, that's the 1% of missing persons. That is also right? true, yes. Because 99% come home. The the actual percentages of people who are reported missing, who are actually legitimately missing and not found soon thereafter is, is so, so low. That also plays into part of this is that there's no funding for police training in missing persons cases for that very reason. Right. Because everything based on police training or, or anything police oriented is based on statistics. Mm-hmm. To me, a training class is a training class. That's not that's not that's not taking a dramatic amount of time away from your police department. What's what's it going to hurt to invest in that? That's that's all where I, that's all that I'm saying is <laughs> police departments out there. N- nobody in law enforcement is actually listening to this podcast <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, but I have if, to imagine that's true because I think I would I would get a lot more hate mail if that were the yeah, case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that, that, that would be my advice. But okay. But I do talk a lot about the police response in this case with Eloise and, and I really do think that they did what they could do, you know? I mean, cause this is just one of those cases where there just is so little to go on, but they knocked on every door literally, which I will get to. Yeah, let's get into it. But yeah, so first of all, before we do, I want to give a big shout out to one of our supporters on Patreon, Christine H., because this case was actually a suggestion from her. She lives in Australia, and she told me that this case has kind of stuck with her for her entire life. So it seemed interesting. I want to dig a little deeper. So thank you for the suggestion. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And then before we get started, I'd also like to give a shout out to our newest supporter on Patreon, Lee M. Thank you, Lee. And if you are interested in supporting us via Patreon, you can do so at patreon.com slash ATTWG pod. But now let's get started on Eloise's story. Yeah, let's get into it. Eloise Ann Warledge was born on October 8th, 1967 to Patsy and Lindsay Warledge. Her parents described her as a timid girl who was prone to fits of asthma. She wasn't known for being particularly adventurous. When she would go for school field trips, for instance, she would generally stick close to her teacher. Her parents, Patsy and Lindsay, were young when they met. Patsy was a student teacher. She was artsy and friendly. Lindsay was an introverted, logical academic who was three years older. 
The pair seemed to be opposites personality-wise, but they clicked and were soon married. The couple moved to a home just over 500 yards from Beaumaris Beach in Victoria, Australia, and started their picture-perfect middle-class lives. And it really was for a time. The neighborhood was close to schools and shops, and they made friends in the neighborhood. It was one of those idyllic places where the children all played outside together and the parents threw barbecues for the neighbors. As I mentioned before, Eloise, who was soon to start fourth grade, was a shy girl, but, you know, she was kind of starting to come out of her shell a little bit. She seemed to have inherited Patsy's artistic side, and she's in brownies, which is helping her to become more outgoing and confident. Everything was nearly perfect for years, but as the children started to become more independent, the Whirlages began to drift apart. It really seems that it was a case of opposites attracting until they didn't. Patsy was an art teacher and, you know, kind of a free spirit. She made friends easily and was incredibly social. Meanwhile, Lindsay preferred to keep to himself and had kind of a pompous air about him. Apparently, he fancied himself intellectually superior to a lot of his peers and spent a good amount of time at the Caulfield Institute of Technology, where he was a professor. As time went on, the two just kind of stopped getting along. According to an article in The Age, friends started to notice that Lindsay's comments to Patsy were just getting more and more sarcastic, and there seemed to be a lot of tension in the marriage. And apparently it was so bad that even Eloise was starting to notice. Patsy seemed as though she wanted to save the marriage, so she suggested that she and Lindsay attend couples counseling. But Lindsay didn't want to have anything to do with that. So instead of giving up, though, Patsy just went to counseling on her own. But if she had been trying to repair her relationship with Lindsay, therapy actually seemed to have the opposite effect. She basically realized that her marriage was over and was able to come to terms with that. Yeah, and that's that's okay. I mean, mm-hmm. y- you go to therapy thinking one thing, but your goals for therapy may not meet up with what therapy actually does for you. Right. The fact that therapy led her to to an area of closure, that that's good. Mm-hmm. I realize this is going to sound crass. It sucks that this is going to lead to divorce. Presumably, I don't know. Mm-hmm. You're you're telling me the story, but I I mean, you get to a point where sometimes you can't fix things, right? And that really does seem like where they were, right? She wasn't quite ready to officially end things, but it does seem like Patsy kind of checked out after this. She kind of ignored Lindsay and just let her own life. And the problem is, this only increased the resentment that Lindsay had toward her. Yeah, see, so at that point, when once she realized that it was over, then she needed to act. Right. As opposed to letting things go on. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what happens. If one side realizes it's over but doesn't act on it, mm-hmm. then it's, it's just going to come back as resentment from the other side because the other side is still thinking, at least it's in some way, that they're still in it. Yeah, and you got to keep in mind, too, this is 1975, right? Yeah, right. I and mean, who knows so what's that, going on. I yeah. mean, this is past the free love, quote-unquote, era of the 60s, but yeah, the 70s but weren't a whole lot better. They really weren't, and, you know, people weren't getting divorced. Like, I mean, Stepford Wives came out in the 70s. Like, yeah. the whole idea of a nuclear family was still very much alive and very important and a lot of emphasis was placed on keeping that intact. So by 1975, the marriage was basically dead. Both Patsy and Lindsay started having affairs. This went on for a good chunk of 1975, but in September, Patsy finally came to the realization that this whole setup was just pointless, really. It wasn't going to give either of them long-term happiness, and it wasn't ultimately in their children's best interest either, so she began to talk about separating. Now, I know it seems right now like I'm spending a lot of time focusing on Patsy and Lindsay's marriage, but it does become relevant to what eventually happens with Eloise. Toward the end of 1975, Patsy is telling Lindsay that it's over. Lindsay agrees in theory but doesn't actually make any moves to kind of end the marriage. 
he knows it's over, but he doesn't really want to take the next steps. So he kind of keeps delaying everything. It actually sounds like the fact that Patsy was the one to bring up separating bruised Lindsay's ego. So he started making demands. He demanded that the separation should be on his terms in a way to regain some power within the situation. He was earning his master's in business administration at Monash University at the time, and he told Patsy that the separation would have to wait until his exams were over in November. Oh. <laughs> okay. So part of that also, we also have to take into consideration this was the 70s, mm-hmm. and machoism was was very much alive. Oh, yeah, for sure. Know? So. Yeah. So again, like having the the wife be the one who was kind of leading this, like that was not uh, not common at all. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, and so he again, it, like I said, he was just really trying to take back some power. Yeah. In this yeah. situation. Yeah, I'm, that I'm really not, I'm not ultimately wasn't up to him. Yeah, but I'm no, not. but you get it, right? Like, I mean, oh, yeah, you totally. Get how this whole thing it's was this, unraveling. It's the seventies, mm-hmm. like, yeah, his wife basically brings up leaving him and. He's kind of got a safe face. I'm not siding with him in in any way. No, no, but I think uh, all of it makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. It does, right? especially for the time. Yeah. And again, Patsy was pretty checked out of the whole situation by this point. So she agreed. She's like, fine, exams, November, whatever. I don't care. So November came and Lindsay completed his exams, but he still wasn't ready. They couldn't separate yet, not with Christmas so close. <laughs> <laughs> so that you know it wouldn't be fair to the children so sure. at, right at this point patsy was getting a little frustrated with his stall tactics but she was like you know fine whatever we'll stay together until after christmas but she wasn't going to just let him keep doing this because she could already see where it was going right so she set a date her 33rd birthday was on january 10th and she wanted him out by then that's good setting your boundaries right exactly and it seems like eloise was team mom throughout all of this and started to become distant toward her father when they finally broke the news to her patsy said that eloise quote took the news in her stride end quote the other two children were presumably a bit too young to really realize what was going on they were six and four at the time but january 10th came and Lindsay was still there By this time, Patsy was pissed. She had been accommodating, but again, she checked out of this relationship months ago and she was ready to move on with her life. And from her perspective, Lindsay was just hanging on for no reason. So the relationship only further deteriorated. And because of this whole situation, the couple wasn't really communicating very effectively, as you can imagine. Yeah, shocker. Right? So while Patsy's perception was that Lindsay was never going to leave, he actually was making plans to move out. Oh, so were all of these delay tactics so that he could set up his own life? I mean, I don't think so. I think some of them was just he really was delaying just for the sake of delaying. But no, he like eventually did start doing things. Okay. Um, He had been looking at rental properties and he had even toured one on January 10th but he just hadn't made a final decision yet. So he had told the estate agent like that he needed a few days. So he wasn't quite sticking to Patsy's timeline, but he was making moves. Okay. But Patsy was done. Her friend who lived across the street threw a birthday dinner for her and invited their friends from the neighborhood. So Patsy basically like threw up deuces to Lindsay and went alone to the dinner. And that was a big statement because again, this is one of those really tight neighborhoods where everybody's friends with everyone else. And so by going to this birthday dinner alone, she was basically telling the entire neighborhood that her marriage was over. So it was extremely public. And this was the type of thing that was apparently just not done in this time or place, right? Like, It was a huge, huge deal. According to that same article in The Age that I mentioned before, the whole thing kind of made the guests nervous, actually. They thought that Lindsay was going to react badly, 
there was, quote, a general feeling that this was a humiliating act and that a serious confrontation could result, end quote. And it does appear that the guests were half right, at least. There was no big confrontation or anything like that. Lindsay didn't come over and cause the scene, but he did skulk around outside like a creep. What? Why? (laughs) Well, so several... These these are all friends of his as well, right? Yeah, I know. But so it was like, that's, I think, what made it even more creepy kind of so several guests from the party say that they felt like they were being spied on but Lindsay says he was only outside inspecting the cars of the people who were there (laughs) like in a normal way (laughs) (laughs) yeah what in what normal way there's like a a host of a party or not even a host. No, like, somebody who was invited to the party. <laughs> yeah, like, what are you inspecting in cars? He says he was curious. Just, you know, want to see who was there in a in a cool way. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. So when Patsy came home around 2 a.m., Lindsay was still up waiting for her. Uh-huh. The couple got into an argument that apparently got loud enough that the neighbors heard. And these are, you know, single family homes, to be clear. Like, we're not talking townhouses or apartments or anything. And the neighbors considered calling the police, but ultimately decided against it. Because they didn't want to, you know, get involved. Yeah, as is the case. Right. What it seems like is that Lindsay liked to seem as though he was in control but he was having a much harder time with the breakup than he was letting on. It's weird for somebody that's a control freak to (laughs) freak out when he loses control. I know, so strange. So the next morning, Patsy was like, all right, dude, you got to go. So Lindsay called up that estate agent that he had met with and said that, you know, he'd take the flat that he'd looked at with them. So that was all sorted. Like he was like, all right, whatever. I'm out. I'm out. I'm going to, this isn't working. I get it. I'm leaving. Good. Yeah. And so on Monday, Lindsay had a gig as a guest speaker at Honeywell Securities. And whether it's just the way the industry was, or if he was drinking away his problems, Lindsay went pretty hard that day. So he went to lunch with an executive at Honeywell and they shared a carafe of wine. Nice. Right. But the problem with carafes is that they aren't a standard size. Yeah, you don't know how much is actually. <laughs> you don't. It's like a that. really fun gamble. Could, could be <laughs> half a bottle of wine. Could be two bottles of wine. Exactly. You don't know. Exactly. We, yeah. You don't know, and that's why it's like the best kind of roulette. <laughs> but so, so we don't know. Like all I know from the article is that they shared a craft of wine, but like I don't know how much that is. You sure. know, yeah. so that could be a very small amount or like an insane amount. <laughs> I don't know. But either way, he continued after work and met some co-workers for drinks at a local hotel. And again, we're getting into weird measurements now because the article said that he had a jug of beer at the pub. And I don't know what that means. <laughs> is, is that some Australian measurement that we don't know about? I think it is, a but I think it jug might of also be a pitcher. Oh, okay. Right? Like yeah. that would kind of make sense, wouldn't it? I suppose. I mean, when I think of a jug of beer, I think of like a growler. Oh, yeah. But I don't know. But I mean, I, in 1975, I don't think they were like doing growlers. I don't know. This pubs. is also Australia. I mean, yeah. that's a knife. Oh, don't. Oh, God. <laughs> Just saying. That's like, awful. Um, yeah. So maybe a pitcher. I don't know. But a jug. That's what we've got. But. While he was still at the pub drinking his jug of beer, he rescheduled his meeting with the estate agent uh, for the next day, which totally makes sense because, like, so he was supposed to meet the estate agent that day on Monday. Well, I mean, also good on him for being able to recognize, like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna make this meeting in the morning. <laughs> no, it was supposed to be that day. Oh, that, so, like, oh, he super yeah, wasn't no, making wow, it. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, and so, well, but that's the thing. but, but I mean, he was. You know, lucid enough to realize 
I'm not making this meeting. Yeah. So Yeah. And so what's interesting is some people point to that being suspicious that like he preemptively postponed this meeting. But to me, like dude's been drinking all day. Like I also, I am a real estate agent and I wouldn't want to meet with myself after drinking all day. No, absolutely not. And also, you know, keep in mind the backstory that you just told. Yeah. Like, this was basically the day that he was like, even though it had been coming for months, it was the day that he was ready to be like, okay, I'm out. Right, right, so right, right. he's probably drinking away his sorrows. Yeah, exactly. I'm not defending him. I don't know where this is going, but, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, so all of this to me, it, it kind of makes sense, right? Lindsay leaves the pub at around 445 and heads home. And so, by the way, I want to just point out right at the top of this that I have this whole timeline from that article I mentioned earlier in The Age, which was written by crime reporter John Sylvester. And this article was written in 2003, and it's the most complete account of what happened to Eloise that I found anywhere. And it's an amazing article. We're obviously going to link it on the blog, so you should all go read it. So Lindsay gets home after the pub, and this is Monday, January 12th. He continues drinking and apparently plays Monopoly with the kids while Patsy goes to her jazz ballet class. Okay. And remember, he and Patsy... This is like dinner time that, yeah. not, that night after mm -hmm. he'd been drinking all day? Correct. And he and Patsy are basically living separate lives now, so she's just kind of like in and out all evening. I, dude, I've been there. <laughs> and yeah like i'm sure she had things to do but i'm also pretty sure she was just kind of trying to spend as little time uh, around him yeah, no, it, that that kind of living situation becomes real awkward yeah for the brief moments where you're basically passing the kids off yeah yeah, yeah. and so she was really like she had that you know jazz ballet class but then she's also like oh i'm sewing this dress let me go show it to a neighbor <laughs> and like you well, know it was just stuff like that well yeah you i mean you come up with excuses to not be in the house yeah uh, yeah honestly i mean and so I, that I get it. seems like what patsy was kind of yeah. doing that day and so I don't know exactly what time the kids initially went to bed, but according to Lindsay, Eloise came out of her room at around 9.15 and got a glass of milk. She then went to the TV room and sat with Lindsay while he explained his side of the breakup to her. Oh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so he seems like he's at that point of drinking all day. Where he's like, oh, you wanted a glass of milk? Come here and sit with me while I drink and watch TV and let me explain how everything went wrong between me and your mother. That's a much later conversation. <laughs> yeah. Much, much later. Yeah. Or, or a never conversation. Yeah. So uh, not the greatest, but like, again, I can, kind of, I can picture all of this very clearly, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah, me too. So then he said that Eloise went back to bed at around 10. According to his statement, while he was home, he had two scotches and a bottle of wine with dinner. What? Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Then after dinner, so like while he was watching TV, he drank port. Oh, my. Look, I am, you You know, I <laughs> drink a lot. <laughs> No, but that's a lot. That is a lot. Yeah. Holy shit, that is a lot. Right, but I, I bring it up because I think it's extremely relevant to what happens later. Okay, let's okay, let's go. I, yeah. I won't I won't Yeah, we don't need to talk about it now. Yeah. Because but I do want you to keep it in mind. He must have been okay because Patsy left. And kept yeah. on leaving, right? Like, after right. she got back from her class, she went over to her friend's house, and she didn't get home until around 11. So when she got home, the screen door was closed. So we're talking front door, right? So they have a, a screen door, and that was closed, but the actual front door was wide open, mm -hmm. which, again, this is January, but in Australia, that's summertime. Right. Yeah. They didn't have air conditioning, so that was all very common. There was nothing weird about that. Okay. And this was the type of neighborhood where people 
would do that, right? Like they would leave their windows open at night. They would leave their screen doors closed and their doors open. And Patsy said later that she had meant to shut the front door on her way to bed, you know, just because like, again, front door open, sure, let the air in, but not necessarily after you go to sleep. Yeah. Um, But she forgot. She checked in on the children after she got home and went to bed. So she got home at 11, you know, did whatever, and then checked in on the kids and then went to bed. Around 11.40 p.m., Lindsay turned off the TV and also went to bed. Now, it seems like the routine that they had was that they would leave the hallway light on for the kids, and then the last parent who went to bed would just shut it off on their way to bed. But that night... Lindsay apparently forgot to turn the light off. Patsy says that she woke up at 4.45 a.m. to go to the bathroom, and she noticed that the hallway light was off. So this is really confusing to me. Off or on? Off. Okay. No, I know. (laughs) I can see the gears turning in your head, and this is exactly the same thing that's confusing to me. So who went to bed first? Because I thought- Patsy did. Patsy Patsy went- she so went when to did bed. she get home and he continued she, to stay up drinking? She got home at 11 and then he turned off the TV and went to bed at about 1140. Okay. But if she went to bed first, then I wouldn't she assume if it was the routine that Lindsay had turned off the light before he went to bed? Yes. And so the whole thing about Lindsay not turning the light off came from police So, like, did he tell them that? Like, did he say, oh, I didn't turn off the light? And if so, why wouldn't he have turned it off? The only other thing I could think of that would make sense is if Patsy went to bed first, right? So she went to bed, she was in bed, but not necessarily asleep. And then Lindsay came in at 1140, did not turn the hall light off on his way in. Patsy was still awake and noticed that but neither one of them felt like getting up to turn it off. Oh, so you're saying this particular detail came up in a police report. Yes. But we don't know why or how it became so important. Well, no, it's important because allegedly when both of the parents went to bed, the light was on. And then when Patsy got up to go to the bathroom at, you know, 445 in the morning, it was off. Oh, okay. So the story is that sometime between approximately 1140 p.m. and 445 a.m., the hallway light was turned off, not by the parents. But I can't see a way that that makes sense unless... Like I said, they were both in the bedroom, both awake, both realized that the light was still on, that Lindsay and forgot to turn of it off. Got up and turned no, it off. no, no. That that <clears throat> neither one of them turned it off. And they both said, Oh, it's still on. Let's go to bed anyway. Because the whole light thing, like basically they're saying that neither one of them turned it off. And that becomes very important in the timeline of this. Right. Because, okay. Yeah. And and they both noticed that the light was still on, but neither one of them are claiming to turn it off. Well, that's what I have to infer because either way, like, because otherwise it doesn't make sense. I mean, okay. So let's get, let's get into the, the, the details of this because, you know, we're talking about a light, but I, I don't know the significance of the light other than them creating a timeline. Right. And that the light was on and then it was off and they did not turn it off. Also seems like a weird thing for a kidnapper to do. Just sure. But let's just get through it. When Patsy and Lindsay gave statements about what happened the next morning, like their times didn't exactly match up, but police kind of say, you know, it's obviously very stressful and, you know, sometimes Sure, and they were Times both. Don't they match were up. Also, both drinking. So you know. Well, no, we don't know that Patsy was. There is nothing about that. Okay. But in any case, um, 
According to Lindsay, so this was his initial police statement, he woke up at around 6.30 and went and got the milk and the paper from the porch, like so cute, um, before returning to bed. Shortly thereafter, Anna and Blake came into their parents' room and started playing. Blake apparently said that Eloise wasn't in her room, but no one really paid attention to him. At around 7.30, Patsy got out of bed and then, you know, went to go try to find Eloise. But 10 days later, Lindsay made like a second statement to police. And in that statement, he said that Blake was already in their bed when he woke up around 7 a.m. And that Anna came in around 10 minutes later. He said that he asked the kids to get the paper, but they like ignored him, <laughs> which seems sounds right. Very yeah. correct. Yeah. And so he went and got it. And he said that the front door was closed at that point and that the clock in the kitchen said 715. Patsy's original statement to police said that she got out of bed at 7.55 a.m. and Anna ran up and told her that Eloise was gone. But in her statement, her second statement, 10 days later, she said that she had taken a shower before Anna had alerted her. Okay. Patsy said that she was checking the front of the house when Lindsay called out to her from Eloise's room. She came in and he showed her that the curtains were pulled to the side, the window was rolled open, and the screen was cut. So first floor bedroom? Yeah, it's all like a one-floor house. Okay. Now, I'm just going to cut to the chase and tell you that Lindsay became a suspect almost immediately. Okay. And, you know, this is for a few reasons. The simplest one is that when a child goes missing, typically it's because someone close to the child did something. Sure. And that person is often a parent. But there are a few more non-basic reasons, one of which was Lindsay's affect. Now, remember, this is a man who is very logical and introverted. He's not big on showing emotions and vulnerability. Though, it does seem that he has a temper, as evidenced by the fights that the neighbors overheard. So, once he calls the police, but he doesn't call triple zero, which is the emergency line in Australia, he calls the Bomaris police station. So, this is a little weird on its own, but police also later say that when he called, he was like pretty chill about it. He said that there had been a break in and that the only thing missing was his eight year old daughter. Okay. So a couple of things there. First, obviously weird to say that about a break in at your house. Say the only thing missing is my daughter. I think it reported as a, as an abduction right. first, but that aside, Calling triple zero, is that what it is? Mm -hmm. Which is equivalent to 911 stateside. This is also the 70s, and that, that in the 70s, 911 was very new. That was, that was not something that would, it, it was, it would be more common back then to ha actually have your local police department. Number. Right, right. So him not calling triple zero. AKA Australia's version of 911. Like that's, that's in the 70s. Like that's not uncommon. So police came and once they saw the cut screen in the bedroom window, it became clear to them they don't need to waste time thinking that this is like just some little girl who kind of slipped away. Or good, good. Was, there we go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the responding officer called in detectives right away and a search party was formed. According to an article in the Canberra Times from Wednesday, January 14th, 1976, just a day after Eloise was reported missing, more than 60 police officers joined in the search on Tuesday, concentrating on the three kilometer radius around the Whirlage home. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yes. Exactly. But unfortunately, they found no trace of her. I, I don't want to sound crass and say it doesn't matter because, I mean, obviously it <laughs> obviously does. Obviously it does. <laughs> but, but like. They did it. Fucking though. A for effort here. Right. Yes. Yeah. And unlike in some cases we've covered, the police also canvassed the neighborhood. 
and they immediately heard reports of a prowler in the area the night that Eloise went missing. But police were leaning less toward a random stranger abduction and leaning more toward somebody closer to Eloise being involved, with one of the senior officers telling the paper, quote, It is very probable that the abductor would have known the family as he knew which window to go to, end quote. Which, like, okay, sure, yes, but that's not definitive to me. No, it's not definitive to me either. Yeah. Uh, what, what, on the suspicion of, of, of dad in mm-hmm. this particular case, let's set aside of the fact that, like, what in the holy living hell would be the motive? Mm-hmm. I'd be curious how the screen was found. Oh, we're going to get to both of those things, okay. actually. All right. All right. <laughs> because speaking of motive, it should be mentioned that someone else thought the abductor was close to home. Eloise's mother, Patsy. Patsy immediately suspected Lindsay of being responsible for Eloise's disappearance. Why? Well, she thought that his story was fishy and that he was acting weird, basically. So, like, he said some things, like, you know, when he was giving his statement to police, he said that he turned off the TV at 1140 and then he went and checked on the kids and then went to bed. And Patsy's like, um, he never checks on the kids before he goes to bed. Yeah, okay, but I mean, maybe he did because he was feeling sentimental that night because uh, he realized his marriage was over and like he wasn't going to be around his kids. Yeah, all the time. Like that. That's okay. Yeah, but that's kind of what what we're talking about, right? But it is important to note that she didn't believe that her husband had harmed Eloise. In fact, thinking that Lindsay was responsible gave her comfort. Because she thought that he had orchestrated this whole thing as a way of delaying their separation. And so, like, she she honestly thought that, like, he had, like, done this whole thing and, like, hidden her somewhere or something like that just to delay this whole thing. And so she's like, well, Eloise is safe. This is stupid. But I'm going to get my daughter back. Because, like, after all, this was the day he was supposed to leave. But interestingly, Eloise's disappearance did keep the couple together for a little longer. So apparently police wanted them to kind of maintain a united front. So Lindsay actually ended up staying in the family home until June, at which point he finally moved out into a rented flat. For his part, Lindsay vehemently denied being involved from the very beginning and even demanded to take a polygraph, like, immediately which the police did not take him up on. And I don't really know why the police wouldn't just let him do this, but in any case, they seemed like they continued to examine all of the possibilities, including reports from the neighborhood of suspicious people and vehicles. Between January 21st and 23rd, police canvassed 6,000 homes. Damn. Yeah. Yeah. And based on this, they were able to log over 200 suspicious incidents that happened on the night of Eloise's abduction. 200 that night? Yeah. Okay. I, I want to hear more about that. Yeah. So one neighbor had a shed broken into. Another saw a car driving down the road with its headlights off. Another neighbor saw a green Holden station wagon parked near the Warlidge's home. Around midnight that night, another neighbor saw a young man walking along the Whirlage's fence line. But most chillingly, yet another neighbor saw a young man run and jump the fence into the Whirlage property. Do we have a, a, a timeline on any of these? Well, yeah. So that one was after midnight. And then around 2 a.m., another neighbor reported hearing a child cry and a door slam, like a car door slam. And remember that green Holden station yes, wagon? Green yeah, station wagon. Apparently, several months later, a different neighbor reported seeing a similar station wagon parked near the Whirlage home a full week prior to Eloise's disappearance. 
So obviously police looked into this and they found that a car fitting that description had been stolen nearby in December of 1975. So just weeks before Eloise went missing, but they were never able to track that vehicle down. Police formed a task force for this investigation. And in addition to canvassing those 6,000 houses, they also spoke to more than 100 family members of the Warlages across the globe and over 200 friends and associates. They also looked into sex offenders in the area. You know, and it's truly hard to judge a case that that's that's this old, but it truly seems like they put all other resources behind finding this little girl. Yeah, I mean, it seems like they're exhausting all their options. It really does. It should be said, though, that while they were doing this, they were still looking at the family. There are two important pieces of evidence that I haven't really talked about yet. One is Eloise's little brother, Blake. He told police that he heard, quote, robbers come in and take his sister, but he didn't say anything because he was afraid that they would take him too. Then... How, how old was Blake? Four. I, you know, I mean, we just had dinner with our three-year-old telling us about how a, a, a character from a video game scared him last mm-hmm. night, so... Yeah. All right, now we're going to get to the bedroom window and the cut screen. All right, let's do it. And so this is a weird one. Police later determined that the screen was cut from the inside. How did they determine that? Because I think it was like rolled. It was like cut and then the screen was like rolled in a way that made it look like it was cut from the inside. But more importantly, the window was one of those windows that has the crank that you roll it out. It wasn't like an up and down window. Okay. And it only opened to 38 centimeters. So it was open to its max width of 38 centimeters, which I asked Alexa, and it's only about 15 inches. We have literally have one of those windows right right here in the recording studio where we're sitting. That would be very difficult to get somebody out of. Exactly. And I saw a picture, and we have a picture on the blog. Like, they took a picture of Eloise's room. And again, I have no spatial reasoning. So I'm like, 15 inches seems too small, but I don't know. But when I saw the picture, like 15 inches is too small. Like There's no way that an adult could get in and out, much less an adult with an eight-year-old child. Yeah. Did any of those pictures show the screen as it was? No. Supp- supp- okay. But this window, like I know the screen bothers you. I don't care about the screen, the window bothers me it bothers me because both parents admit that the front door was left wide open so if one or both of them were trying to misdirect the police by cutting the screen why right wouldn't it be just as likely that a random abductor would just walk through the door that was left open provided they knew the front door was open Right. Well, I mean, you know, eyes like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I get it. And especially considering the reports of this green. Holden station wagon. Yeah. The green station wagon yep. being in the neighborhood for, for a week. Right. Beforehand. And, and all of this, all of these instances of people jumping the fence, mm-hmm. people casing basically the house. Mm-hmm. And these were reports from neighbors. neighbors. Yeah. Not them. Not them. I, I don't know what the motive would be uh, aside from stranger abduction, mm-hmm. but that seems like a lot of work to get to a, a stranger abduction, you know? Yeah, and but the, the window thing is so like the screen, you know, people are like, oh, well, they, you know, it's somebody who is connected to Eloise and they, they cut the screen to make it look like somebody snuck in through the window, but it's just like, I don't, the, the door was open, like... Uh, whether it's somebody who was related to Eloise or a or stranger, th- the door was open. Right. Like the, they could none have very of easily done that. This makes sense. And so with the door being open, that to me, it makes it equally as likely as it was a stranger or somebody she knew. Right. Because, you know, if she's this timid girl, who's not going to go willingly with some stranger, 
then she's certainly not going to go without making a fuss through this like 15 inch window. By the next Monday, January 19th, police told the Canberra Times that they had what they hoped was a break in the case when they brought in a 23 year old man for questioning. Detective Superintendent Fred Warriak told the paper, quote, This is the best lead we have had so far. We are following certain information that he has given us, end quote. But ultimately, nothing seemed to come of it. By January 22nd, the state government had offered a $10,000 reward for information about Eloise's abduction, which in today's dollars would be over $60,000. But still nothing. The task force disbanded in late February and Eloise's case went cold despite the search being the largest in Victoria's history. A year later, Patsy was interviewed for The Age and she expressed optimism that Eloise was still alive out there. And this belief was based mainly on the fact that she had no proof that she wasn't. The year, of course, had been a nightmare that had changed the entire town. Parents in their suburb started locking their doors and keeping their children closer. They would shut their windows during the summer despite not having air conditioning. But beyond just the general destruction of an entire town's way of life, the Whirlage family was further victimized. About two weeks after Eloise's abduction, the family received a call from a man who said, quote, I have your baby. I have your baby. I want $10,000. Yeah, there we end go. Quote. Yeah. yeah. And that call turned out to be from a 17-year-old who was simply making a prank phone call. Over the years, the case got transferred around and reinvestigated. In the early 80s, a few new suspects emerged. In 1975, Patsy and Lindsay were involved in a local theater troupe. One of the other members was apparently a convicted child molester. Also, another man who was convicted of similar crimes worked at a nearby milk bar and could have encountered Eloise. But other than their records and their general proximity to her, there was no other evidence linking either of them to her abduction. Yeah, and it's also important to note this is the 70s, so DNA existed. Right. The the science behind discovering DNA did not exist. Correct. Yeah, and I think when we talk about DNA, it's important to note that there was no blood found at the scene. There was nothing like that. Yeah. So even if DNA testing was available, there's just very little that could have been tested. Yeah. And that does kind of come into play in a little while. Okay. All right. So there were also rumors over the years that a famous serial offender, Raymond Mr. Stinky Edmonds... <laughs> could have been responsible for Eloise's disappearance. <laughs> of, all, of all the names I know. for a criminal, you, <laughs> like, I know. You, you, can't, you can't want that to be your, your name in the newspaper. <laughs> yeah, so he was convicted of a series of rapes in the 70s and 80s and also convicted of molesting his three-year-old daughter. He eventually went to prison for the murder of a teenage couple, and police think he was responsible for many, many more crimes. W was he in the area? Yes. So that's the thing. He was in the general area and he did drive a Holden station wagon. Okay. But other than that, there isn't any other evidence Connection. that links yeah. him to yeah. Eloise at all. Right. That prank call that the Whirlages received in the weeks after Eloise's disappearance wasn't the only incident of that kind either. They also received a letter that was signed from a man named Fred, who alluded to Eloise being sexually assaulted. It took 19 years, but in 1995, a man by the name of Ken Benfield was put on trial for sending this letter after his fingerprints were matched to the letter. Benfield was 17 at the time the letter was sent, and police didn't think he was involved in Eloise's kidnapping. In 2001, the case was reopened yet again, and a 12-month reinvestigation of new leads commenced, and it all culminated in this inquest. 
But by that time, you know, Patsy and Lindsay, of course, hadn't moved on because you can never really move on from something like this. But they had accepted that they would probably never really know what happened to their little girl. Patsy told the age that her family, quote, had come to their own form of closure years ago, end quote. Similarly, Lindsay didn't have high hopes for the investigation, saying, quote, I was dubious. It is essentially the recycling of memories, which are over 25 years old, end quote. And to be fair, it basically was. Though police had hoped that the advent of DNA could shed some new light on the case, that didn't end up happening. Uh, you can't imagine that they collected any. Well, yeah, and that's the thing. So, I mean, they obviously connected, collected evidence, and and at the time, they couldn't test for DNA because that wasn't a thing. Sure, yeah. But, yeah, like I said, there wasn't blood. There wasn't, you know, bodily fluid. Like, there just, there weren't a lot of opportunities for right. DNA to be on any of the evidence that they did collect. Right. Though Lindsay and Patsy both remarried and tried to move on with their lives as best they could, Tragedy would continue to touch them. In 1997, 21 years after Eloise's kidnapping, their youngest child, Blake, was struck by a car and killed while crossing a street on a rainy night. Jesus Christ, really? Yeah. Quote, people still see me as a victim. End quote. Patsy told the age in 2003, quote, but I don't live like one. End quote. Patsy concentrated on creating art and was close with her remaining child, Anna, and cared for her three children. Lindsay lived a quiet life, and though he was dismayed at being considered a suspect for so many years, like, he understood why. Quote, we were tangible. There was little else. End quote. Lindsay died in 2017 with no answers as to the fate of his daughter. I don't see a motive for either, either parent. Yeah, neither do I. The, and there, there's no there, there's no driving force like okay, they were going through a divorce and it mm-hmm. was sloppy and shitty and one or the other kidnapping their child is not that didn't meet any of their goals. Right, right. And there was there's there's no money involved in it. Mm-mm. You know, like there's there's no motive for for them to be the person to instigate a kidnapping. And so this is why, and you know, we're kind of circling back to this very late, but one of the reasons why I wanted to focus so much on what Lindsay had been drinking that night is that like, if he was going to carry out some crazy <laughs> plan. Look, there there is zero chance <laughs> that he was, functional enough to do that exactly that's my point yeah. right like when i read that rundown of everything that he had had to drink today i'm like there's no way like there's no way he could have like again i'm a heavy drinker and like that would have yeah i mean to, <laughs> to lord that would have put me out right and then to like kidnap your child and then keep her gone like no trace no, no trace. evidence yeah. nothing for yeah. 45 years yeah I just I don't see it happening. I think the answer lies with the with the green station wagon from witness testimony was in the neighborhood Mm -hmm. a week prior Mm -hmm. and was casing the neighborhood. And I I, I'm not saying it was that serial killer. Yeah, Mr. Stinky. Mr. Stinky. Very well could have been. But I think we have a case here where it's the one percent. It right? is the one percent. Like it's the one percent of the worst possible scenario. Yeah, and it just they it just happened to have happened during probably one of the worst times in their lives. Yeah. What are what are either of them gaining from it? Right. There there is no motive behind it for either of them. That so to me that clears them. Yeah. You said that one of the kids, one of the other siblings, mm-hmm. heard Blake. What did they hear? They heard robbers come and take Eloise. So they heard somebody walking. Yeah. in the house. So maybe they came in through the front door, mm-hmm. tried to push her out the screen door for whatever reason, right? 
And then realized it was too small. Yeah. And then took her out the front yeah. door. Yeah. Yeah. No. And that could be it. And, and, but the robbers thing, that's another reason why I don't believe that Lindsay is involved. Because to me, he said robbers, plural. Yes. First of all, which who knows if it is like, okay, he's poor. It's the middle sure, of the yeah, night. Yeah. Who knows? But I just think that if it were his dad, he wouldn't have said robbers because the way he described it, it was like he was in bed scared right? because somebody was taking Eloise and he didn't want to be taken. And I think that if it was his dad, that wouldn't have been the story that he told. Well, I don't think Eloise would have reacted by screaming. Did anybody say they heard her scream? So the I only, thought somebody did. Yeah. So the only thing that we that has to do with the scream is that one of the neighbors said that at around 2 a.m. they heard a child scream and a car door slam. Okay. So that presumably means that the scream was outside of the house. Right. So if it was one of the parents, Lindsay presumably, I don't think there would have been a scream. Right. I don't think there would have been any disruption in the house Mm -hmm. to where any of the kids felt unsafe because if he was doing it or he was orchestrating it, I I don't see where any of the kids would have been scared because it's dad. Exactly. What I can see is if this was a stranger who wasn't, overtly scary looking or maybe if it was somebody Eloise did know who wasn't a parent who was you know again later on there was a teacher who was investigated like a librarian you know this guy in their theater troupe like you know so somebody who might have been known to Eloise you gotta think all right it's the middle of the night she's dead asleep if an adult comes in to her bed and goes hey hey here, come here. We need to go outside. Like we need to, and just like, just makes up a story, right? The kid's half asleep, doesn't know what's happening. I mean, I could see a child just going with them. Sure. You know, yeah. if they're not doing it in a scary, like I'm going to snatch you, here's a knife kind yeah, until, of way. Until they like get their wits about them and right. suddenly they're outside going into a green station wagon. Yeah. And, with and they're like, wait a second. People second's. that they don't actually know. Yeah. 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 But that initial like, hey, all right, I need you to get up. Like we're going to go and we need to leave and we need to go to the hospital. Like, you know, we need to go because your mom had an accident. Like just, I don't know, just making up some sort of story. Right. And I can see that like if a kid's half asleep, just going along with that to a point. Yeah. And I I do think the screen I'm still hung up, hung up on the screen. I think it is, it's, a, it's a red herring, but not on purpose. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think. Yeah. The, it could be just an abandoned plan. So I w I would like to see the layout of the house mm-hmm. and what is immediately behind that window. So is that where neighbors saw the, uh, green station wagon? I I mean I do think it's the front of the house, but I'm not positive. I'm I'm just wondering whether they went in through the front, thinking that they could cut the screen and push her out through the back, mm. and then realized shit, like it's actually too small. They can't actually fit her through it, and then dragged her out th- back through the front. Yeah. And that's why the police are insisting that this was cut from the inside. I don't see the motivation from the parent side. Yeah, and neither do I. But Eloise's kidnapping still captures attention across the world, and especially in Australia. But Patsy is at peace with not knowing, saying, quote, I long ago realized that I didn't need to know what happened on that night, end quote. (laughs) Eloise 
Louise, Ella, and Warwich has been missing from Beaumaris, Victoria, Australia since January 13, 1976. She was four foot seven and was wearing yellow pajamas with the words rock and roll on the front and a music clef on the back. She was eight years old when she went missing. She would be 53 today. If you have any information about what happened to Eloise Warlidge, please contact Crime Stoppers Victoria at crimestoppersvic.com slash AU. You can see all the sources for this episode along with photos and videos at our website and then they were gone.com. And be sure to follow us on social and then they were gone pod on Facebook and at ATTWG pod on Instagram and Twitter. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe and consider leaving a five-star review on Apple podcasts. It will help new listeners find us. And the more people that listen, the more chances we have of bringing someone home. And we'll see you here next week for a brand new episode. See you next week. And Then They Were Gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. Our research, writing, and editing is done by Kona Gallagher. The music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And Then They Were Gone is a Little Monster production. Hey, you can do it!